so welcome everyone to uh, the Analog Astronaut Conference, and we have Scott Parazinski is with us tonight, today, this morning, and he has uh, something amazing to share with us. So we'll go from here. Scott. Got it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ron. It's great to be with everyone uh, here from a very rainy, uh, very early morning in Houston, Texas. Uh, I know people are streaming in from every part of the globe, it sounds like, but really thrilled to, to be part of this. Um, uh, my my good friend, Sian Proctor, uh, invited me to this uh, a few weeks ago, um, and it's really pretty extraordinary to think about where she is right now. I guess she's up on Mount Rainier, probably shivering, um, maybe you know, working her way up towards uh, the summit a little bit, but uh, um, you know, to think about her trajectory in all of this, uh, you know, basically being very interested in in analog environments and going to extraordinary places um, as as a scientist and an educator, um, and now to be on the Inspiration Four crew. So I've got some slides that you know honors uh, honors that. But um, hopefully you're able to see my uh, screen. Ron, let me know if that's not streaming for you guys. Is yes, there? We have that. Okay, great. Well, um, yeah. So. Uh, Basically, the, the talk here is uh, To Infinity and Beyond, um, and I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about the, uh, the notion that uh, essentially all of us are, are explorers, um, and there are many different places on, above, and underneath the planet that we can uh, test our skills, uh, learn new things, and prepare ourselves uh, to either one day uh, go into space or to be a better educator or just for um, the, the pure enjoyment of it. And, um, and so I've been very fortunate throughout the course of my career as an astronaut, but also as a physical explorer to do some you know, really crazy things that I'm gonna tell you about. Um, and I hope to uh, share with you my approach to going into you know, hostile, challenging environments and getting the most out of them. So that's, that's kind of the gist of my talk. Um, so who am I? Well, uh, if uh, you're not aware, uh, I'm a child of the Apollo era, so I'm, I may be older than some of you here on this call, but uh, I grew up idolizing uh, the Apollo astronauts. And so I was a little tyke when astronauts first set foot on the moon. And uh, so I had model rockets and posters on the wall and ambitions to be the very first to set boot prints down on Mars. It didn't quite work out that way for my personal career, but uh, it did work out pretty darn well overall. So, um, you know, as a physical explorer, I had the good fortune to fly on five uh, space shuttle missions, do seven spacewalks. Um, but uh, as a an explorer and uh, inventor, a product developer, um, I've I've been able to go to lots of different uh, really unique environments. Um, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, use those environments as a catalyst for my own innovations. Um, because I, I think one of the reasons we, we as humans want and need to go to challenging places is because um, of our curiosity, but also because those investments allow us to bring back new innovations, new science, uh, new technologies, new opportunities that benefit all of us here in the regular world. So, um, you know, I've been deep beneath our oceans and different types of submersibles uh, to the top of Everest, which I'll show you a little bit. Um, inside an active volcano and uh, all across Antarctica as well. So um, every uh, environment has its unique challenges. And so being prepared for those things is kind of the gist of, I think what makes, you know, being an analog astronaut special. It's, uh, you know, the, the mindset of being prepared. What are we going to do there? How are we going to get the, the most uh, yield out of that experience? How are we going to work in the most constructive way as a team uh, to do that? So uh, just hearkening uh, to uh, my, my good friend, Cyan Proctor, and I'm sure all of you know her, and of course know of her recent uh, um, selection to the Inspiration4 crew, but I've just known Cy for a number of years uh, through my wife, uh, Minnie Wadwa, um, and I remember actually taking this drone photo um, less than a year ago, I think, actually, a uh, beautiful hike uh, near uh, Tempe, Arizona, and um, she had just gotten involved in uh, Project Possum. And uh, I was asking her, you know, well, gosh, you know, you, you, you uh, were so far along in the, uh, the NASA astronaut selection. Now you're in, in Possum. Are you looking forward to flying in space someday? And she said, 
No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I just, I really love, uh, you know, working in analog environments and, you know, it's just an exciting way to, to learn and to, to, uh, um, expand my, you know, my scope as an educator. Um, but I, I really don't think, uh, you know, I really want to fly in space. Well, of course, of course she does and she's going to, and, and I'm just so proud of her, uh, for having been selected to, uh, the inspiration for crew. And so a little Scott, bit later, real quick, if you could, can you make that full screen for us? It is full screen actually. Um, yeah, it's in, um, are you not seeing it in presentation mode? Yeah, it's not in presentation mode for us. Yeah, it must be something in your platform. Let me see if I can, let's stop sharing and um, see if we can rework the, uh, the PowerPoint. Okay, it's, now it's not letting me uh, go to it. This is really strange. Um, gonna have to share it again. Window. Now it's not letting me see my own presentation. Okay. <laughs> That's really strange. Hmm. Well, sorry, guys. Houston, we have a problem. Let's see if yeah. we can play <laughs> through it. It does happen. Um, so whenever you share your screen, you can do it from the... Uh, How about now? Are you able to see that window now? Not yet. Hmm, okay. So it's the... Uh, There we go. How's that? Are we back in business? Yep. And if you open the, uh, so I can see it's on StreamYard, and we need the, uh, if you open the, um, if you open your, uh, let's see here, your PowerPoint, it will open full screen. It already is. Got full screen. It's we're not seeing that. I'm not sure where. All right. Let's do something different here. All right. Let's there we go. All right. Well, you, you probably have the uh, um, the border. It's not in presentation mode. Yeah. It, I, I'll go try presentation mode again, but I think it's it's probably not going to work for us. Let's try. You seeing it in full screen? Yeah, it's not doing full screen for some reason. I'm not sure why. You can see it on the left, but um, in the lower right-hand corner, if you hit that, it should do that and no, make it full screen. No, I've already done that, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I, I think it must be something funky with uh, the StreamYard interface, but... Yeah, so I've, I've got it on. Uh, what would you prefer? Would you like... Uh, like that looks like great. We'll go from there. All right, that sounds good. Um, so in any event, uh, uh, it, it's really cool that uh, that Cy is now um, you know, training in earnest for a launch in September. And uh, you know, we're certainly going to be there to, to cheer her on, and I'm sure a number of you will as well. Um, so you know, we live in extraordinary times. As all of you know, with these these additional platforms that are uh, you know right on the the cusp, uh, Blue Origin is uh, I think next week going to announce uh, you know ticket sales for the very first uh, trips on their vehicle, which <clears throat> may even beat uh, Virgin Galactic to taking uh, paying customers up. And of course, all the things that are going on with SpaceX and and uh, the broader NASA mission of returning uh, crews to the moon and you know, going back. Uh, going back to the South Pole of, of the moon and ultimately to Mars. So 
I mean, we're living in incredible times. Um, this is really disappointing. I'm seeing what you're showing, and um, it's a shame that there's no better way to display some of these uh, these images. But um, uh, anyway, um, so I wanted to take you on a few um, analog experiences uh, along with me. So one of the uh, the more interesting things that I've done in my life is um, be part of different science expeditions around the world. And this was a cool trip to uh, uh, La Concobre Volcano on the border of Bolivia and Chile uh, several years ago. And a group of NASA scientists called astrobiologists, uh, which I'm sure you understand is the study of Earth in, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the study of life in the extreme. So uh, here in the Atacama Desert, uh, deep beneath our oceans and geothermal vents, uh, the Antarctic, uh, uh, dry valleys, every place that we um, think life should not be possible to exist here on our planet, it does, it thrives. And so these are scientists that want to understand life in the extreme such that when we do go to Mars, we'll be able to identify it, characterize it, um, be ready for it. And so this is an expedition um, led by Natalie Cabral, who I think is uh, the head of the, the SETI Institute in um, uh, Moffett Field, California. Um, she has some high position there, but uh, she led this expedition with a bunch of other uh, NASA scientists. I was invited to the, uh, the team as uh, a guest astronaut, but also as a mountaineer and a physician to evaluate this environment as something that future uh, planetary astronauts might want to take part in, you know, to be able to be a contributing member of the science team, um, to have, you know, have this as an analog environment for future um, lunar and Mars uh, explorers. So um, came into the expedition on its second um, uh, incarnation. They had gone the year before. They took this beautiful photo of the Summit Caldera Lake. Um, this is at nearly 20,000 feet above sea level. And what they had done up on top of the mountain, some poor soul had had to carry a inflatable raft and inflate it there in the very thin air at the top of the mountain. And then a diver had to get in a dry suit in frigid waters and drop a plumb bob down to characterize the lake, to understand the depth of the, the environment, uh, to map in a very crude fashion uh, this, this unique environment. So I was getting briefed on this. We we're going to be going back to the same spot the next year. Um, and I wanted to contribute as a valuable member of the team. And so I asked for a small budget uh, of $500 to see if I could do something better that would be more expansive, more capable. Now, I wasn't you know, part of the prior team. I didn't have the history of uh, what they had done before. So um, I came at it from a different perspective. And I went out and I bought a toy boat, a battery operated boat that I put a GPS uh, receiver on as well as a, a fish finder. And I drove a toy boat back and forth across this summit called Dara Lake, and we created this incredibly detailed uh, bathymetric map of the, uh, the summit called Dara Lake. And so the, the point being, you know, when we um, bring together multidisciplinary teams um, with different skill sets, uh, different uh, technical backgrounds, different cultures, and so on, invariably you end up with a much more uh, valuable um, complement of capabilities and, and you can, can pull more science out of it. And I think you can also just have a, a better time if you have people that aren't all of the same mindset. So we had a, a great experience on that, that expedition. Um, other facets of my life, I've had the opportunity to oversee healthcare in Antarctica for the United States Antarctic program. In fact, I was the, the chief medical officer for the center for polar medical operations. And, uh, that allowed me to, to travel to you know, various parts of uh, the icy continent and, uh, and then also to, to do healthcare in a very extreme environment. Um, and, and my office was here in the lower right, that's uh, UTMB Galveston. So you know, one of the hottest places on earth, uh, delivering care across the, the coldest uh, spot on earth. But uh, um, I, I think one of the exciting things about um, exploration of our, our home planet and and the broader sense in space exploration is that it's driving technology. And so certainly the, the space program was a catalyst for 
the development of telemedicine, but the COVID-19 pandemic has, has really you know, kicked that into high gear. And now probably everyone has had uh, the opportunity to have some sort of a, uh, a telemedicine consult with their, their primary doc. So these, these are great investments in, um, in our future when we, when we go to, to extraordinary environments like space and, and in Antarctica as well. So the reason I wanted to show this particular slide, though, is my uh, my uh, uh, proposal to NASA has been that I think the best place to train future lunar and Mars astronauts would be on Antarctica. Actually, um, I think it's it's essential for those types of missions to have an element of life threat to it, for there to be real consequence for the actions that you take. Um, and I know many of you have worked in other types of analog environments where you know, there's you know, human performance and behavioral analyses and, and uh, hardware development, and that's all good stuff too. But in terms of real preparation for uh, distant voyages, um, I, I believe that there needs to be uh, a real consequence to your action. So, you know, undersea habitats, Antarctica, high mountaineering expeditions where you, you can't just walk out the door and... Uh, um, you know, call, call the simulation complete. You really need to be in an environment where you're really dependent upon your, your teammates. Um, so I, I, as I was talking about a little bit earlier, um, I think also going to these environments is an incredible opportunity to invent things that benefit us all. And so just a simple example, um, uh, I don't know if any of you have read John Krakauer's book, Into Thin Air, but if you haven't, I'd strongly recommend it. It's one of the, the best kind of uh, human um, frailty uh, stories that you can possibly come up with. Um, it was the, the season of 1996 when many souls were lost on Mount Everest. Um, there's also a lot of heroism and bravery uh, in the recovery from it, but sadly about 11 people uh, died that season un unnecessarily. Um, and one of the things that I learned from John Krakauer's book, actually, is that uh, a lot of high altitude climbers end up with about three liters of water ice in their backpack, which is completely useless to you on the descent when you really need to have your wits about you, you need to be hydrated, well nourished, and so on. That's the, the chances of your um, of perishing on a, a big mountain like Everest are much greater on the descent. So uh, I came up with a hydration system that sat inside my, my down suit and it had a uh, closed feedback uh, heater loop on the drink straw such that it would never freeze up. So just a simple example of, hey, I, I don't wanna die on Mount Everest. Here's a hydration system that, you know, we, that uh, would protect me on, uh, on a climb like this, but for skiers, snowmobilers, and you know, outdoor people, the military, um, this is something that we're trying to commercialize right now. Um, if you've not been to the Himalayas, to uh, um, Nepal, strongly recommend you put it on your, your bucket list. It's uh, one of the most you know, stunning you know, visual places you'll ever be, but also the people are just incredibly uh, hospitable and, and wonderful. And uh, I spent two, some, uh, two um, seasons on Mount Everest, the first time in, in 2008. And this is a photograph of me actually at Camp three, 24,000 feet above sea level. I'm not sure if you can you know, squint and see the, uh, the bloodshot in my eyes and uh, the pain that's in my face, but I've, I've got excruciating low back pain. Um, not exactly sure what's going on at this point, but uh, ended up you know, tumbling and tossing and turning all night. And, uh, and then the following morning realized that my summit was gone. I realized that if I were to take another step higher on the mountain, I'd not only be risking my own life, but potentially putting my teammates in a life or death situation. And so I, I hearken back to my prior training, um, both in space and also in, um, in analog environments, and, and put my team first. That's a really essential uh, component of, of, of any uh, team ethos. But um, this is a very unforgiving environment, and there are now, a, now, I believe, about 300 souls who are still on the slopes of Mount Everest. I didn't want to be 301, so uh, I made the right decision, um, realizing that 
if I were to go higher and I got worse, uh, there's no one strong enough to be able to carry me down. So I've, I've got to do it on my own power. And so every 20 or 30 minutes or so, this is my, my very good friend, Bob Lowry, we'd find a relatively flat space and, and um, ice my back down, stretch out a little bit, and uh, was able to finally descend. Um, I got down to camp two and uh, was woken about three in the morning. Uh, I was told that my, my climbing teammate here, Monty, had a horrible nosebleed. He actually had a bilateral nosebleed and he had lost about 20% of his blood volume in the middle of the night. And uh, it was like a, uh, a horror scene in his, in his little tent there at 21,500 feet above sea level. And um, I've got a crippled back uh, to boot, but I was able to get his nose uh, packed and the blood uh, loss stopped. And the following day uh, we hobbled down like, you know, uh, Frankenstein down to Everest base camp and ultimately he needed a medical evacuation helicopter to get him to safety. And as his personal physician, I got a chance to ride with him, which is pretty cool. Um, in any event, uh, ultimately got back home to my uh, residence here in Houston, Texas, got into an MRI magnet, and I had a ruptured disc uh, in my lumbar spine that needed emergency surgery. And so within two hours of that surgery, I was uh, pain-free and up and walking. And a couple months later, I was back in the gym without any restriction. And then the following year, in the spring of 2009, I was able to return to climb Mount Everest with my good friend, Anuru Sherpa. And I'll just take you up to the top here really quickly because uh, I want to get to uh, questions that folks might have. But um, again, the, the mindset that you learn from analog environments and just being uh, cognizant of your environment, of, of the strengths and weaknesses of your team, your own preparation, uh, all the, all the myriad of details that you have to put into any kind of an expedition uh, culminate in execution of a plan. And so this photograph is a nightmare uh, situation. This is uh, my friend, John Golden, on my expedition, uh, who decided that he wanted to take a chance at a very short weather window on Mount Everest. There was a prediction that there might be a one day weather window to get to the top if, you, if everything was timed properly uh, before a big storm was coming through. Well, forecasters are smart. They have great computer models, but they aren't always right. And uh, turned out to be about six hours in duration. And uh, they had to turn around uh, just above camp four. So this is a group of eight climbers, seven of whom are lowering John down the Lhotse face of Everest. He's broken three ribs and dislocated his knee. So if you know what any of those things feel like, it's, it's really bad. And if you multiply it by four, uh, it's really, really bad. Uh, but uh, s somehow they were able to get him down. Uh, but the message is don't cut corners. Don't, don't cut your principles. Uh, wait for the beautiful weather window like this. This is uh, Camp 4 at 26,000 feet above sea level, 8,000 meters. Um, and it's an extraordinary place. And, um, and, uh, you know, you, you don't want to miss the scenery uh, just because you, you're in a hurry to get home. So in any event, um, once you do arrive at, uh, at Camp 4, you rest for several hours, hydrate as best you can. You're on supplemental O's uh, for a little bit. And through the, the middle of the night, actually, you cross this plateau, uh, attain the, uh, the right uh, skyline there, follow that ridge line up to the false summit. And then if you're lucky, at uh, just before sunrise, and I don't know if I can play this video for you. Let's see if it works. In, uh, there we go. And um, so if, if you if you time it properly, you'll arrive right before sunrise. This is 4 a.m. local time. There's a beautiful golden Buddha up on top of uh, Mount Everest, as well as some Tibetan prayer flags. It's, it's really awesome. Crunchy uh, snow, and you know, it's about 25 degrees below zero. And the first thing you want to do is plop yourself down. Uh, and rest, but uh, it's a, really a, a neat uh, testament. Um, one of the things I'd share with you is that the things that come hardest to uh, mean the most to you. There you go. And, um, so it took me um, 
you know, two seasons to get to the top of the world. Um, but as a result, um, you know, I, I draw incredible strength from it. You know, if I if I was able to, to summit that first year, it would have been a, a powerful life experience. But you know, uh, suffering all told, about four months on the side of Mount Everest, um, yeah, it gives me you know, great confidence and strength taking on other challenges in life. But yeah, definitely uh, uh, one of the most difficult things I've ever ever had to do. Uh, this is a, a really kind of a cool photo. This is the the uh, summit shadow uh, of Mount Everest on the descent. So a couple of other uh, quick expeditions that I'll try and show you here. Uh, got some embedded videos as well. This is Messiah Volcano in Nicaragua, an expedition I was invited uh, to support as a mountaineer in a position. And uh, the goal uh, is to implant a, a sensor ray around this uh, lava lake, the youngest in the world, um, as well as around the crater, and ultimately create an enormous data set to which we could apply big data tools Chris, go back to, uh, to uh, uh, develop um, a model of uh, uh, predictive analytics. If we could have an early warning system for eruptive activity, there are 2 million people that live in close proximity to this volcano and 800 million people around the world uh, who live in, in proximity to um, volcanoes. So this is a, a very real threat um, to society. And so my, my good friend Sam Kosman and I set the very first boot prints adjacent to this, uh, this lava lake. It uh, was 1,200 uh, feet of uh, descent. Um, we set up a, a steel braid cable and essentially a, a, a zip line, but it was a, a winch system that allowed us to get down safely as well as you get supplies down to, uh, to lower levels of the, uh, the volcano. But to be just 30 feet away from molten rock with waves crashing up on this uh, uh, this lava beach. It was an otherworldly experience, certainly the, the craziest thing I've ever done. Um, but the same sort of mindset uh, went into the preparation and the, the safeguards that we, we set up to, to go do this. And, uh, and thinking about the new technologies that we needed to apply uh, to make it possible. So um, I wanted to jump in now and tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, a mindset for preparing for space flight. And I had imagined that a number of you, I hope, uh, are going to get a chance to fly in space in the not too distant future, whether it's through Project Possum or other opportunities that are going to be out there. And so um, what is the mindset? What do we need to think about when we're really getting ready to go into uh, a very, very high risk environment? So now, this is uh, uh, aircraft training, which I think is a wonderful way to you know, get in the game in, a, in a, an environment with real life consequences we talked about earlier. And so we, at NASA, we would fly uh, T-38s, but uh, Cessna 152 is just fine as well. Uh, but getting up into an operational environment where there's uh, interaction with other people, air traffic control, other aircraft, it's a, it's a wonderful preparation. Um, obviously, understanding the environment where you're going is, is critically important as well, and understanding the systems that you're going to operate. Uh, this is uh, the, the forward flight deck of the space shuttle. Of course, the, the SpaceX Dragon uh, looks like a Tesla. It's got a couple of flat screen TVs, and it's uh, um, much sleeker than the, the space shuttle cockpit. But all the things that you see in front of you here on this slide are represented behind the panels in um, the, uh, the SpaceX Dragon as well. The subsystems, life support computers, uh, thrusters, and so on, communication. So understanding how all those things work, how they fail, and also having a mitigation strategy. What do you do if, uh, if they don't work? Um, a mindset that, uh, by the way, these are uh, a subset of slides that I shared with Inspiration4 crew a few weeks ago, uh, kind of an astronaut 101 um, briefing that I shared with Cy and her crew. So uh, these are you know, catered primarily for getting your mind ready to go into space and how do we you know, get the most out of that experience. But I think they're generalizable to other types of analog environments where you guys are, are working. So um, try and think about it in that context as well. But uh, this is kind of a, a 
a neat chapter in my life. Uh, when I was uh, a little bit younger and probably a lot crazier, I did a sport called luge, which is a winter Olympic event on a, a sled about the size of a cafeteria tray, feet first on an ice track at about 75 to 85 miles an hour, pulling high Gs. And the way you mentally prepare as well as physically prepare for doing something like this is to uh, pre-visualize every detail of what you're about to go do. You can only physically manage about four runs down the track every day, both for a logistics perspective and also because it really took its toll on your body. You're pulling high Gs and every once in a while you will fall off or you'll, you'll careen down the track and you know, it can be very painful as well. So um, we'd only do about four runs a day, but we would do multiple runs uh, on our back in the start house, lying back and moving our bodies exactly the way we would on the track uh, a few minutes uh, down the way. And uh, what was interesting is when we got really good at this, it would take 45 seconds um, in the start house to pre-visualize this and our time on the track would be 45 seconds. We got so finely tuned to the detail of what we're doing. And um, you know, th this is a very difficult sport. It, it requires a lot of uh, physical power, but with finesse. And if you're if you overcorrect or undercorrect, correct, um, the results can be disastrous. So um, the same sort of mindset can be applied to you know, performing surgery, doing a spacewalk, any really complex um, uh, cognitive motor uh, type of an activity, flying robotic arms, um, flying an airplane, uh, pre-visualizing what you're going to do. So seeing your pathway to success, but also thinking about, well, what do I do if things don't go perfectly per plan? So along those lines, uh, um, one of my uh, mentors early on in, as an astronaut was this guy here, Dr. Story Musgrave, really colorful uh, character. He's got like 27 advanced degrees, a perpetual student. He's a philosopher and poet, um, among many other things. But um, he helped prepare me for my very first spacewalks. And uh, uh, he was also the leader of the, uh, the Hubble servicing uh, uh, mission, SM-1. So a very uh, prolific uh, astronaut and, and great thinker. And what he would always tell me is the only thing certain about EVA, extravehicular activity, is the uncertain. And, uh, and so I, for a period I was assigned as the, uh, uh, the lead spacewalker on the fourth Hubble servicing mes mission. And so I learned how every electron forced through the, the circuit boards of that telescope, how every photon was gathered, how uh, every one and zero, every bit of data uh, traveled through the spacecraft. Um, really understanding the, the underpinnings of not just how it's supposed to work, but how it could and will fail. Um, example of that, uh, unfortunately, uh, you can't see the uh, cool photo. I guess I can probably move it here. Um, this is the Chris Despaz satellite that uh, uh, I flew in my very first mission into space. And uh, an amazing satellite that we deployed uh, using the robotic arm. And it was gathering all sorts of critical data for atmospheric scientists and people who are studying the ozone layer. The problem was if the, uh, uh, the robotic arm or the shuttle couldn't accept the satellite at the end of the mission, all this precious data would be lost. And so using this mindset that, that Story had, had uh, taught me, I realized, well, you know, I've got tools inside the space shuttle. If we were to go out on an emergency spacewalk, Joe Tanner and I could go out and we could unbolt this data processing unit and at least bring the data home. We might have to throw away the satellite, but we would keep the, the precious data. So that's the kind of uh, uh, mindset that I think we all need to think about when we go out to do you know, critical science or critical operations, whether you're you know, in an analog simulation or you're in an analog environment doing real science. You know, thinking about that is, is very, very important, getting most of the experience. Um, being in space is a lot of fun. I hope you have an opportunity at some point to you know, fly in space, but if you don't, at least to fly in parabolic flight. It's a lot tougher than it looks. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, we describe uh, rookie astronauts as bulls in the China shop. Um, it, they'll get out, they'll untether, 
they'll uh, push off their their seat and they'll they bang bang their head on the ceiling and then start kicking each other and it, it's it's pretty comical unless you get kicked in the head by one of them but uh, you really have to think in a different mindset like, how am I going to keep track of all the all of my belongings um, in a zero G environment unless you tether it tape it uh, bungee it store it in a locker it's going to end up in the cabin air cleaner in a couple of days which we also affectionately you know, refer to it as the the lost and found. So really thinking through um, your body orientation, um, I think it applies also to, uh, you know, kind of remote austere environments. If, if you're on a mountaineering expedition and you have to share a tent with someone, it can be really challenging to get into your backpack to get that one bit of, you know, gear that you need, uh, you know, to get your, your cap to sleep for the night or uh, whatever happens to be. So, you know, thinking about not just what you're doing, but your impact on the people around you. Very, very important. Um, this is a kind of a cool photograph uh, in a period of uh, space shuttle mission called post insertion. After we first get up into space, um, we put all of our extra gear in these big mesh bags and, uh, and then we kind of bungee them all against uh, one of the walls of the mid deck. And uh, this is me doing some dumpster diving is what we called it. But uh, uh, you really have to think through um, where you're going to store things, how are you going to access them in the future, have a really detailed plan of who's going to be doing what and when. And so this is uh, an example of one of the plans that I developed for um, this is STS 100, uh, all of our crewmates and uh, who's doing what on any given um, any given uh minute this is it these are five minute blocks of time the, the most demanding part of a spatial emission is once you arrive in space uh, you've got to convert your your spacecraft your launch vehicle into an orbiting laboratory and uh, get out of your suits store everything and get ready for bed um, because the next several days are going to be as busy as all get out you know rendezvousing and docking with the international space station and and so on so Coming up with a, a very detailed plan like this, let everybody know exactly who's doing what. And uh, if people are working together in teams, they were color coded. Um, it's a little bit anal retentive here, but uh, you know, for certain periods of time in, in your missions, it may be important to have that kind of uh, control over it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, keeping track of your stuff can be really, really difficult. Um, it's uh, even a, a, a challenge on a mountaineering expedition on, on my climbing expeditions, you know, I've had a lot of friends uh, lose critical pieces of gear. And, uh, you know, if, if you lose your, your mitts, you're not going to be going to the summit, you know? So it's, it's so vitally important that you, you know, be really focused on, on doing that. Another thing that's uh, probably apparent to you, if you've, you've been to some of these, uh, these analog environments, they're typically in really extraordinary places. Um, and there's a lot of uh, adrenaline uh, associated with it. And before you know it, the, the, the time is gone. So having a plan for what you're going to do there and also a plan to capture as much of that experience, not just in your memory banks, but uh, in photography is really important. So I'm gonna talk about how to get the best imagery here in just a minute. Um, Another aspect of uh, space flight that I, I think uh, may apply to undersea exploration as well. Um, it certainly applies to our weightless environment training in, in the MBL. This mantra of going slow will make you faster. Uh, the mantra that you know, we taught our spacewalkers is slow equals fast. If you try and rush through something, you're going you're gonna to drop a tool, you're going to get snarled in a tether, you're gonna you know, kick your buddy in the head uh, or, or knock a solar panel or do something that you really don't want to do. So being very, very um, deliberate in your actions uh, is, is really critical, especially when the task is vitally important. Um, so if you're about to throw a switch or perform an action that has a serious consequence, get someone to back you up. And we call this challenge response, but. Uh, one person is reading the procedure and the other person has their, their finger on the switch or what have you. Yes, I see you uh, 
on the uh, right switch, uh, take that to the off position. And, and so having that challenge response kind of mindset for critical activities is, is really important, especially um, early on in a space flight. We're not really sure why this happens, but uh, perhaps it's just the overwhelming nature <clears throat> of being in space, but um, you're, you're, you are a little bit foggy and uh, you know, it, you're, you're floating there. You've got to think about how am I going to restrain myself here so that I don't float away when I flip that switch. Um, you're, you're looking around, seeing the, the spacecraft maybe upside down in a way that you've not seen it before. So it's just a sensory overloading kind of an environment. And so since there is that uh, you know, fog that, that's there, having a backup for critical activities is, is really important. The other thing is, uh, you know, we would develop our own uh, uh, cue cards and, and notes in our notebooks that we would take with us or in an iPad. Um, there is no up or down or left or right or forwards or backwards in space. It just happens to be whatever orientation you're in. And as you can see here, if you if you let go of your meal, you know, it, it will drift away from you before too long. So you know, thinking about how you're going to manage all that. A few notes from um, from space flight that uh, you know, perhaps will be useful for you guys, but um, um, it, it may actually convert over to other types of analog environments as well. But the sleeping is actually a little bit more difficult than you might expect. Um, there's, there is a lot more adrenaline in space. You're not experiencing the same physical workload. Uh, you know, your heart isn't pumping against, against gravity. Your muscles and bones aren't um, you know, supporting you against gravity. So uh, the workload is less. Um, you've got a lot more on your mind. Um, you may have some some back pain associated with spinal elongation, and um, and also disc swelling. Um, and also, you just don't have any physical contact with the bed. And so uh, NASA has this clever solution. There are actually pillows where you can actually Velcro your head uh, to uh, a pillow and have subconsciously uh, a contact with something that will give you the comfort then to, to fall asleep. But it, it's really kind of strange. Um, space motion sickness you may have heard of. It's, it's uh, somewhat akin to say sea sickness or car sickness, but if you get either of those conditions here on earth, it doesn't mean that you're gonna have space motion sickness in space. There's uh, a different mechanism wherein the inner ear uh, is not experiencing the, the force of gravity and uh, your eyes have to become your your primary sensor of which way is up and down. But uh, for some reason, about half of astronauts on the first mission get some degree of motion sickness. If that happens, we just give them a, uh, an injection of Phenergan right before bedtime, and typically the following morning, they're, they're feeling just fine. Um, life, uh, life in space is, is a lot harder work than you might think. Um, just the simple act of getting ready in the morning, you've got to Velcro your brush when you're done with it, uh, you've got a Velcro or bungee or your toothbrush. You know, what do you do with your toothpaste when you're done with it? Uh, just a lot of nuances of things that you, you wouldn't necessarily think about. I, in, for the, the interest of time, I won't go through a lot of uh, the, the medical stuff here uh, regarding space flight, but just to understand that uh, your body does undergo a lot of physiologic changes uh, exposed to you know, different types of uh, environments that have significant impact on your well-being in space and also your ability to come back to, to Earth in, uh, in good health. So it is very important that we exercise every day when we're in space so that we can, in an emergency, run away from the ship, uh, should it be on fire or what have you. Um, but there are a lot of different uh, things that we concern ourselves with, both for, uh, say, low Earth orbit flight, but even greater risks when we start to think about long duration missions to, to the moon and Mars. Um, but for the, the medics on, on the call here, uh, thinking about your unique environment, whether you're in a high altitude environment where you need to have uh, medications to help you with uh, uh, high altitude pulmonary and cerebral edema. Um, if you're an undersea environment, do you need to have access to a hyperbaric chamber? You, know, you, you need to cater your, your medical capability uh, to the risks that you could face there. And, and there are always going to be things that uh, you can't anticipate. Um, you know, I've had to treat 
um, subungual hematoma, basically a, uh, a, a collection of blood beneath the fingernail at uh, 21,000 feet on Mount Everest. And you don't have the fancy tools that you have in an ER, so you have to make do with uh, you know, propane stove and, uh, and a paper clip that you heat it in, in the stove to get it super hot and you, you puncture the, uh, uh, the nail bed and relieve the, the pressure. Um, so you have to do a little MacGyvering uh, on occasion, not just in the medical sense, but you know, just across the board in expeditions, I think. Um, so what I've uh, compiled for the, uh, the Inspiration4 crew here are a list of things you really don't wanna miss when you go up into space. And uh, you know, we could certainly talk about some of these things uh, later if you'd like uh, in Q&A. But um, I, the reason I show this to you is I know you're going to all sorts of different environments. It's really important to think about a to-do list of what you want to accomplish from that unique environment, you know, what personally and, and scientifically and professionally you want to accomplish, maybe educational outreach, but to have a to-do list because if you don't have it written down, you're unlikely to get it done. So there are a lot of really unique experiences that uh, people going into space shouldn't miss. Uh, this is my list of things compiled from, from years of experience, but um, I have a list for, for mountaineering and, and uh, for dive expeditions as well, and just to think about that. <coughs> how, are we, how are we doing for time, Ron? Should we? Yeah, we have a couple questions. We have like four or five, if, you want, or if you're ready to do uh, a few yeah. of those. Yeah, why don't we do that? I just have some, uh, some notes on photography, um, you know, you know, really thinking through what you, you want to gather, um, even pre-flight, uh, that, that really tell stories. But let's go ahead and, and stop uh, the presentation and, and go to uh, Q&A. That sounds great. Okay, um, cool. So the first question is from Samantha, and she says, uh, she asks, uh, does the Explorer community consider in along missions expeditions? What, what types of expeditions, Samantha? I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, she says, uh, does the Explorer community consider analog missions expeditions? Oh, I do. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think, um, let, me, let me back up and say, I don't think that exploration needs to be extreme in order for it to be exploration. In fact, uh, you know, my bucket list has never been fuller with places that I want to go uh, visit. And whether it's uh, um, to the top of a mountain or inside a volcano or uh, a place that, um, you know, an analog environment where I'm doing a simulation, um, it's, it's a new uh, um, environment that's being explored by a group of people. And so, you know, in, in my vernacular, that absolutely that, that, that qualifies as exploration. Um, I, I think that um, there are members of the, say, the Explorers Club that, uh, you know, might have a uh, different definition of, uh, you know, what truly constitutes a, an expedition. For me, uh, the ones that are the most uh, engaging and I think also prepare for uh, things like spaceflight do involve some degree of skin in the game some doesn't have to be uh, a huge life threat but there have to be consequences to your actions so um you know a, a mountaineering expedition uh, a, a subsea expedition uh, those types of things uh, really force you to um, prepare uh, for a lot of contingencies that you wouldn't otherwise thank you um so the next question is from karen and she asks, um, did you receive any psychological training before you went to space? Great question. And um, the, the short answer is not directly. Um, however, um, there was a lot of effort in the selection process to uh, rule out any you know, serious psychopathology, I, I guess. But uh, uh, perhaps some slipped through the cracks, but probably not too many. Um, the, the type of training that we would do before our shuttle flights uh, typically involved using the National Outdoor Leadership School, 
which I highly recommend to you. It's a, a great team building experience. We would go out on uh, 10 day uh, field expeditions with our, our shuttle crews or our space station crews. And it's a way to explore your leadership capabilities and followership uh, capabilities each day, whether you were in the Wind River range of uh, uh, you know, Wyoming uh, or out in Prince William Sound in Alaska sea kayaking, every day there would be a different leader and uh, it would allow uh, for the, the team to really get to know the strengths and weaknesses of, of the team, provide feedback. It was also just a great bonding experience. And so uh, we, we would go as a crew as well as with our, our lead flight director to build that bridge. And, um, and so that would be, I guess, the only thing that we truly did as, as psychological training. Um, I think more emphasis has to be placed on it the further we go from the, um, from the home planet. So when we start to think about uh, long duration lunar expeditions, probably valuable certainly for long duration missions to Mars where a, a mission might last you know, two or three years. Crew compatibility, the um, cross-cultural element of it, we'll have astronauts and cosmonauts from around the world. So you know, does this crew really click? Are there, you know, coping tools that we can give them uh, to, to manage conflicts that are inevitably gonna, gonna arise? I think when you get that far away from Earth and there's a 21 minute one way uh, communication lag, uh, it's not gonna be the same as being on the ISS when you can just look down out these beautiful windows and, uh, and pick up the IP phone and talk to your family and friends and uh, you know, browse the web there's going to be a real distance felt there, a, a real psychological challenge that's not felt in anything we've ever done so far. Okay. And um, next question is uh, from Erin Bonilla. She asks, uh, you mentioned Antarctica as one of the most realistic space analogs. How do you compare that to living up on Everest? And are the risks and challenges comparable to space analogs? Yeah, so thanks, Aaron. Uh, good to have you with us. Um, so, yeah, in fact, Aaron, I think, was in that photo that I showed of our hike with, with Cy the, um, earlier in my slideshow. Um, yeah, so they're both very similar uh, environments, uh, Antarctica and, and Everest, uh, in that you're on your own, um, you know, especially in a, a wintertime environment in Antarctica. Um, at the South Pole Station, for example, there are no planes in or out for seven to nine months of the year. Um, and so that really, I think, is probably the most austere uh, place that humans can go right now. Uh, it would it'd be easier to get someone uh, back from the far side of the moon than it would be from uh, Amundsen Scott Station in the middle of the winter. Uh, it, it's that severe an environment. So I think, you know, by installing an analog environment, maybe a couple miles away from the South Pole Station and sending the first uh, you know, Mars crews to spend uh, a winter over uh, down in Antarctica would be an incredible way to uh, you know, do a dry run for, uh, for, for deep space. Um, yeah, and, and so what's, what's really interesting, I, I looked at uh, the Analog Astronaut website and it, it, it's really cool to see the, the variety of of different analog environments that you guys have, have worked in. Um, some of them are familiar to me, others are not, but uh, yeah, I think there are, there are different types of uh, you know, simulations that you can uh, be involved in. Um, you know, the, the types of environments you know, where you can actually run through uh, you know, geologic exploration and characterization and um, you know, do EVA simulations uh, and and kind of some of the, the, the team building and psychological evaluations are really extraordinary. Um, and then there are others, you know, like going to uh, uh, Antarctica or, or uh, the Himalayas or perhaps, uh, you know, Nemo, where um, there's an added layer of, well, if, if we come up too quickly, we're going to die. Um, so there's, yeah. there's a, 
an added layer of preparation and safety safeguards that have to be applied to it. Wonderful. And we have one more question before we, uh, we uh, wrap up here. Um, what type of food did you take with you on Everest and how did you use the fact that Mount Everest could be a natural fridge for your, for your consumables to your advantage? Yeah, interesting question. Uh, so um, we, we did have a lot of uh, um, locally sourced um, you know, rice and uh, simple things that uh, non-perishables. Uh, so to this day, I can't look at cauliflower. Um, uh, we, we would have uh, dalbat, which is you know lentils and uh, rice and cauliflower, boiled cauliflower, uh, almost every meal for two months uh, on the side of Everest. So I- Dalbot power. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's rough. And another thing that they would add yep. in for protein uh, was spam, um, which I've never been a fan of, but uh, you know, it's a canned, it's stable, you know, it'll withstand a nuclear war. So um, uh, that's another thing that was very common, but we did occasionally get uh, you know, fresh supplies up and you're right on, on the side of Everest, you've got lots of uh, access to refrigeration, but uh, there, there wasn't a lot of you know, fresh produce uh, available to us. So yeah, we, the, the, the treats for us were uh, Pringles and uh, a, lot of, a lot of chocolate. Always strewn around the uh, the dining room table there. All right, thank you so much, sir. Uh, we appreciate you coming on today and uh, starting us off for this amazing event. And we appreciate you being here and sharing your incredible journeys that you've had. Um, and thank you so much. You're welcome, everybody. Good luck to you, and it was my honor to to join you today. Have fun. <laughs>